to take this opportunity uh, to uh, introduce to you Emmanuel Fuentes. He is the head of data at Whatnot, and he is going to be talking to us today about real-time auctions on Whatnot. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and hi, everyone. Hopefully, this is a, a nice floating head for you all after lunch uh, while you all digest. Uh, but yeah, excited to share our story. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Manuel Fuentes. I lead up data at Whatnot. Um, and today I'll be talking about real-time uh, real live stream ranking uh, in the context of auctions and, and everything else we do on the platform. So what is Whatnot, right? Um, we are a uh, platform, kind of the largest live stream shopping platform in the United States. Uh, really our, our one line slogan here is buy, sell, and go live. Uh, and what does that actually mean? So on the right here, I'm gonna walk through a little bit around what we do and, and kind of why the, the platform is so engaging. Um, so for those who have used Twitch or other, you know, live stream community-based uh, platforms, uh, this will look very similar, except you might notice there's a bid button at the bottom right corner or, or an auction that's ended here in the video. Uh, and so what you'll see is a seller, in our case, a small business owner uh, in this particular case, uh, is kind of showing a bunch of comic books to 78 people in a live stream. Uh, this is real time. Uh, there's a chat going back and forth around the product being shown. Uh, the seller is reacting to the users in real time um, and, you know, reactions and hearts and emojis and all that good stuff is happening here. Um, there's a shop the seller has, you'll see the second icon on the right, uh, where they can have their inventory carry over from show to show. Um, and then, like I said, at the very top, this is an auction platform or ultimately a marketplace. And so people can bid um, against each other for, for these products. And so this is an example of, a, of an auction that just ended um, where someone bought uh, some comic books, some singles for, for $20. What's also really interesting is in the top left, you'll see there's a follow button. And so there's this really interesting kind of social aspect to the application as well. And so how we think about ourselves is this social commerce platform um, and really the, the first of its kind, at least in a long time. Um, and so we were founded back in 2019 uh, as a traditional marketplace. But then in the summer of 2020, we launched this live stream component, which, uh, as you can tell, is very engaging. Uh, we've been on a variety of lists as like the fastest growing marketplace uh, three years in a row. And I think that, you know, a lot of that comes down to this community aspect, uh, which we'll get into quite a bit. There's over 100 product categories on the platform. Uh, as you'd imagine, things like Pokemon cards, sports cards, Magic the Gathering cards uh, is where we started. Um, maybe even toys like Funko Pops uh, or action figures, uh, but quickly have expanded into other communities and hobbies, including vintage clothing, jewelry and handbags, uh, arts and crafts, um, comic books, you name it. Um, really like what we'd like to say is if there's a community around it, if there's a slash Reddit group, uh, we're probably gonna sell it on the platform. And so that's kind of uh, what we're really excited about and that's the passion we have here. Um, Getting deeper into recommendations and, and ranking and just generally discovery. Uh, we think of ourselves as a discovery driven marketplace. Uh, the tagline here is uh, come for the product, stay for the community. Um, people are building communities around these fandoms uh, and products and collectibles. And, and there's just a deep love for these things that, that bring people together. What's also really great, other platforms like Etsy and eBay, you know, um, we have a similar characteristic where people can build independent businesses. Um, and it's not uncommon for us to see folks uh, start off on the platform selling what's in like their basement or garage and then quickly transition into a small business um, and go full time uh, and quit their day jobs. Uh, we even see folks maturing off of the platform revenue alone to build brick and mortars. So it's kind of this really interesting inverse relationship um, what we're seeing, uh, which is really fantastic. Kind of our growth model is what you would expect. Uh, get people to engage, uh, connect with each other through chat, following, et cetera. Um, connect over a, a very you know, interesting show, uh, communicate and, 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 and converse about a product and then ultimately purchase. Um, I think what's really interesting about Whatnot is we have all the problems of a social network, but the, the business model of a marketplace. And so those two dynamics are playing uh, with each other constantly. 
Um, it's a really entertaining surface. I, I urge you all to download the app and, and check out a show. Uh, and it's it's really quite fun, and and uh, and it can be uh, people spend you know many many minutes on the on this single show. It's also a high sell through surface. So what that means is uh, traditionally what it would take in someone a year, maybe to offload in on eBay, um, they can sell a whole you know palette of their product uh, in a single show in a few minutes. And so uh, you know the old adage uh, cash flow is king is really really uh, evident on the platform. What's also really interesting is people come with a core interest for like, let's say comic books in this case, but then can quickly uh, explore adjacent interests. And so we see this like um, uh, compounding effect on the platform where people build new hobbies and connect to larger and larger communities. So we'll get into this, but from a recommendation standpoint, this makes it a very interesting explore exploit um, problem to, to solve. And then of course, we're a shopping platform. People expect the high quality experience. Uh, things arrive on time. Uh, things are not damaged. Uh, they have a customer support queue where they can answer questions. Um, so this is really like, again, our, our discovery-driven marketplace in a nutshell. Diving in a little bit deeper, uh, you'll see here on the right, another uh, video of our For You feed. I think all of us in the room can can attest to the, the expectations the modern consumer has, uh, whether it's TikTok or Instagram. Um, people expect now content being pushed to them versus less so uh, maybe uh, the traditional query uh, answer uh, paradigm. And so you can see here, we had a for you feed that led me to the show. Uh, I actually buy a lot of sneakers. And so they can quickly jump into the show, listen to the product, uh, win something, and then jump back right out into the for you feed to, to continue to explore um, more shows. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, what makes this an interesting ranking problem uh, is that the content is quite ephemeral. The median show lasts about 90 minutes, um, which is long, but also not much when you think of it in the context of a static catalog, like a product catalog um, for traditional e-commerce. Additionally, uh, the, the viewers spend a lot of time on the app. Uh, and so uh, you're looking here like average watch time for a viewer is about 80 minutes. Um, and then this is super important for new users too, right? Um, we want them to be spending enough time finding a product they can find and, and, and exchange on. Currently we have about like 1.5K uh, shows. That's growing though. Um, and we'll, this will play a role into our architecture that I'll show shortly, but it's not that many candidates to rank and retrieve. Um, but again, that ephemeral quality makes it an interesting kind of um, set of trade-offs. And then like any of these kind of video first platforms, people have uh, some expectations with regards to what's happening in session and how quickly that, that interaction model is being updated. And so if you watch the sneaker stream, I would expect more sneakers to be pushed to me or even streetwear uh, right after the show. Um, people are often channel surfing. So traditional metrics like click-through rate might be, might be misleading because just because they're clicking around doesn't really mean a whole lot. Really, you're looking for engagement, like chatting and purchasing and following. Um, what also makes this fun is the latency budget, budget is pretty tight, uh, about 50 to 200 milliseconds for, for kind of this whole end-to-end -end experience, which uh, again, pushes a lot of the constraints. And then lastly, aside from feeds, um, it's not in this demo here in the video, but we also have a vertical scroll experience. So while someone's in the, the video panel, they can just swipe up and down to go to the next show. So for anyone who's worked on this problem, uh, that makes the latency constraints even more uh, challenging. And then how do you keep the recommendations up to date and such? So hopefully the, the video on the right uh, that was recorded during Halloween and also some of this context kind of frames uh, what we do here. So what's some of the motivation for improving our ranking engine and kind of improving the general stack? I'll tell you a little bit about the state of the world before um, some of the drawbacks and then where we ended up landing and some things we're really proud of. And then I'll go deeper into the actual, the actual architecture from there. So before we started this initiative uh, about a year ago, how things worked was there was a table where all the live streams were stored and this change data capture stream was you know, pushed through a native uh, Amazon uh, exchange into an Elasticsearch index. From there, um, leveraging all the, all the fun bits of an, an inverted index, really easy to kind of grab, hey, give me all the current live shows, 
in the categories that this user follows and then rank it based on some metric. Um, some of the downside, which we'll talk about, you know, how metrics were calculated uh, at this point in time were cron jobs on some regular interval, uh, often querying the production data store, which is a big no-no. Uh, and uh, we'd be kind of doing this on a, on a short interval, like five minutes, uh, hydrating the index, um, and then also kind of piping the, these changes uh, downstream for, for analytics. As, yeah, as I kind of alluded to in the con section here, um, the developer ergonomics weren't great. Elasticsearch is a fantastic product, but it's uh, SQL first paradigm is leaves you wanting and it, it's not super easy to use. Um, like I was saying, the cron jobs were not isolated and, and, and kind of broke a lot of best practices. And then DynamoDB streams were really useful for us uh, starting off as the company, you know, as the company was growing, but it was like a non-standard interface for change data capture logs. Um, and so all of this made it very difficult to maintain and for us to make uh, quick improvements. Um, so since then, what we've done, we've established uh, kind of a new paradigm that we use, not just for this initiative, but across the whole company. Um, here we have a set of Kafka uh, streams and, and topics uh, where events are piping directly from the source of truth, in this case, the, the, the live stream service. Um, these piped events were, are then ingested into uh, a Roxa collection uh, that then can like, you know, more natively keep the, the metadata up to date um, as they're all attributes on the event. And then what's also really interesting about this is um, at query time, we can do a lot of joining uh, across multiple Kafka topics uh, inside Roxa collections to then combine both pre-computed and online uh, features onto this index. This whole thing is SQL first. And so the same people who developed the models uh, who know Python and SQL can also build indices and retrieval stacks. And so from a developer perspective, we just got a lot of bang for our buck here. Um, another great set of uh, improvements um, were around not having to worry about denormalized data. Um, yeah, anyone who's been working with Elasticsearch knows that, you know, if you want to do all these cross joins, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, and so not having to deal with that was, was very nice. And then Rockset out of the box comes with uh, great rolling aggregation capabilities. And so this is also a nice way to get out of the cron job world for us. So without further ado, yeah, we'll kind of show you a classic architecture diagram. Uh, we'll go through each of these boxes one at a time, but just overall, this is the, this is the stack uh, that we currently have um, with some slight adjustments. Everything in yellow here is come, something coming from a, a streaming source. Uh, everything in red here uh, is online and everything in blue is offline. Um, and so you kind of see here this, this mixture of systems that, that we'll get into. So before we get into the actual like nuts and bolts, um, how does data flow in the system? We're actually really proud of what we've built here around data contracts. Uh, I know it's a buzzword uh, currently going around, but, but we really feel like we built something very usable. Um, and so what you'll see on the right here is a schematic around how we built, you know, stable, robust, self-documenting self features, uh, sorry, excuse me, events that are decoupled from the application stores. So our application engineers, the product teams, they can iterate on their Postgres and DynamoDB tables. Uh, and we're kind of isolated from those changes because of the contract we've set. Uh, with those teams. And so you can see here, namely uh, a backend source called Live Service written at Elixir. As I mentioned earlier, it's piping those live stream status events that then we can feed into an index. Um, what's really great about this, again, is because we're enforcing this through uh, a schema registry uh, and through code generation, the interfaces are very stable. CI CD uh, breaks if uh, events get broken. Um, and then we have a consistent framework for ingesting this. So we don't have to worry about uh, different change data capture formats. So now that I've kind of ex explained how the data is flowing in the system, uh, they'll provide some context about what these things in yellow are. Uh, and so we have our user activity feeds, both front end and back end. We also have some uh, logging around what was served in the feed and what people saw. Um, all of this syncs into our data warehouse, uh, which right now is Snowflake. Um, and all of this is kind of piped in real time uh, using Snowpipe uh, through one of the, the Confluent connections, which is really great. 
In terms of training, uh, we currently have all our feature definitions in DBT. Um, yeah, all of this is SQL first, which again, like I was saying earlier, the same people who are developing models can then um, understand how to build features and it's not a separate stack that they have to learn. Um, these features are then unloaded as part of some training job, uh, usually in an S3 staging bucket. Um, and we leverage SageMaker uh, to kind of crunch this data and output some models. And, and we'll talk about what we use in a second. Um, we also leverage SageMaker for batch inference. Uh, and so on some cadence, relationships, relationships between users and sellers, users and categories, users and tags, basically these slow moving preferences, we compute offline on some regular cadence. Um, what this looks like are scores, embeddings, uh, you name it, um, this is all kind of crunched together. Also in some of these jobs, we have some offline evaluation uh, monitoring and simulation just to make sure uh, we're pushing models that aren't taking our core metrics. Going a little bit deeper into the actual model nuts and bolts, um, pretty typical of, of ranking recommendation systems. You'll see here for every entity, there's usually a set of counts and rates and different aggregations over different time horizons that forms the basis of um, classical uh, tree-based uh, classification models. What you'll also see here is these same features are fed into um, sequence-based models. Um, for us, we're leveraging a lot of PyTorch and transformer-based uh, architectures to learn uh, various entity embeddings. So this DAG on the right, which is like the current DBT DAG, uh, kind of illustrates uh, all the various uh, aggregations and, and cross joins. What's also really cool is what we recently got into is something called value modeling, where we can combine multiple object, object, objective functions. So probability of someone watching, the probability of someone bidding, probability of someone ordering. And then we can kind of blend these things into a meta learner to understand okay, maybe we want to optimize for engagement right now, or maybe we want to optimize for throughput, uh, sell through, excuse me. Um, and so this is kind of the current state of things inside the algorithmic box, um, which is really fun. In terms of uh, online retrieval and ranking, um, we have all these great scores, all this offline stuff is happening. And so how do we serve this up for the application? Um, like I was saying at the very top, there's only about 2,000 candidates to ever really surface to the user. Um, still, even though we don't need this maybe two-stage setup, we have the representations internally. That way we can um, kind of future-proof our solution for scale. And so what this looks like is everything's housed in, in Rockset uh, currently. Um, and like I was mentioning at the top, we have this streaming live stream publisher of Kafka events, um, generate this live stream index, um, we also, as part of retrieval within that index, uh, can start doing some filtering, whether it's like based on country codes, banned sellers, maybe there's certain tags you want to optimize. Let's say like a, a new Marvel show is out and we want to boost it, um, or just create a, a certain filter around it. Uh, we can do that there in the retrieval stack. Um, from there, we get a kind of a list of live streams that fit some initial conditions that are live. Um, we both use our pre-computed features and model scores and embeddings to then uh, rank those candidates. And then additionally, um, some of these real-time metrics coming from the user activity logs can be used to um, further re-rank the candidates at the very end. Um, that can be done either in rock the natively or sometimes uh, we'll also pre-compute these things in something like KSQL or Flink and dump it back onto um, Rockset through another Kafka topic. So it's really dynamic. Again, some of these relationships between users and sellers are fairly static, uh, but the shows are very exciting. And so you can imagine even over the course of an hour, hour and a half, we might wanna boost a show uh, based on what's actually happening. Maybe there was a flash sale, maybe uh, the seller pulled out some really rare item. And so there's this re-ranking piece at the top that needs to be pretty real time. And like most e-commerce platforms, we also do a bit of blending and boosting for the application. Uh, things like bookmarks, save shows, we inject some element of popularity and trending. We also do a bit of uh, insertion around kind of, um, you know, creating a healthy ecosystem where new sellers can uh, 
um, break out or maybe uh, we have an ads product internally where we can sell impressions. And so that all happens at the very end here, um, which is which is also a fantastic set of like um, pieces that work with Rockset uh, that I'm not presenting today. Uh, other things that you might find interesting is the auction frequency. Uh, like I was saying, stuff that's happening inside the show, uh, we can boost at the very end. And then of course, uh, like any good engineer, there are business site agreements and special events that we'd want to adhere to and, and, and optimize. So all of this is happening inside that content service at the very top. Um, and so this is our kind of our stack in, in a nutshell. So just recapping again, I just wanted to show the whole thing um, over again, now that we've kind of dug, dug into each piece. You might imagine there's some room for improvement, but uh, again, the company being about three years old, uh, we're really proud of what we built here and it's kept up with our SLAs quite nicely. So what's up next for us? Uh, you might imagine um, live streams themselves are of low candidate volume. Like I was saying, maybe one, 2,000, even 5,000 would be really easy. Um, but we have other kinds of entities on the application. So we're actually launching our first eBay-like experience. Um, so traditional products and listings, stuff that you would see on Etsy, for example, in arts and crafts. Um, that that size of candidate pool is more on the 2 million, 5 million, 10 million horizon. Um, and so you can't just assume you can rank everything in real time. We're going to need some type of two-stage system. Uh, and so one practical way to do this is to have some way to reduce the, the, the size through uh, approximate nearest neighbor search uh, as a first filter before uh, ranking. So we're really excited about that. Um, in addition, we're going to build our first for you uh surface specifically around those listings i was talking about and so what does that look like also from uh, user expectations and setting the the real time uh expectation of what's going to get refreshed and how often uh additionally like i was mentioning we use dbt uh for a lot of our feature definitions and our feature life cycle um dbt is great but you can't do everything in sql and also some of the mechanics there are a little um clunky in terms of time travel and so we're looking into other feature platforms and working out how we do non-SQL based uh, feature definitions. And then lastly, um, there are some models which you can imagine, like I was talking about at the top, we'd wanna build on top of live stream features, which are real time. Um, right now it's a combination of coefficients and offline learning, uh, but what happens when we bring this online? And so we're working to build out some real-time SageMaker endpoints that does this ranking and scoring as a post-processing step after retrieval. Uh, so the, the, these are the things we're working on. Uh, really excited to share this in a follow-up uh, blog or, or talk. Um, yeah, for more information, we, we share a lot of what we're doing here. Uh, it's been an interesting journey. And uh, yeah, appreciate you all taking the time. Do we have any questions in the audience? So I guess one question that I have is that uh, your, I've always loved your use case, at least in the abstract, because it feels extremely real time. Like every part of this, like real time matters throughout every part of this process. So I'm just actually curious, because I don't think I've ever asked you this, like how important is real time to the way this, this works together for you? And, and like, how, how is it that you think about this, especially as this journey has unfolded, like from, from the elastic search towards towards what you have now? Yeah, I think it's about speed of iteration for us. And so that's why I focus so much at the top around the ergonomics. Um, there's a lot of technologies and stacks you could use for this, uh, but how do we have the same professionals who are developing the models, building the data pipelines, also building these uh, indices for retrieval? Um, that's been actually from building out the team and iterating quickly. This has been the major learning for us, optimize for experimentation. Um, because yeah, it was unclear in the beginning of the journey how important real-time features would be. Uh, in some cases, we learned the relationship between users and sellers actually is a pretty slow changing preference, but um, users and price elasticity, for example, that might change. Maybe they got a paycheck, maybe they got a check from their grandma. Um, someone's price point is pretty elastic. And so these sort of features end up being really important in real time for the models. So we've kind of seen a bifurcation happen uh, what can we done? What can we do offline versus what actually needs to be in real time? Uh, 
Um, and I think it just, that speed of learning is really important for us. We're still figuring it out. Okay, no, no further questions. Thank you so much, Manuel. Thanks everyone.